Hello and welcome to this short video intended to introduce Richard Kim's novel Lost Names and the broader history of Korea in the first half of the 20th century. This video is intended to help prepare you for the MSU Teaching About East Asia Summer Workshop. My name is Ethan Siegel. I'm an associate professor in the history department here at MSU and I'm happy to be involved with this program which was made possible by the support of the Asian Study Center and a generous grant from the Freeman Foundation. During the workshop, we'll be reading and discussing Richard Kim's novel, Lost Names. We're hoping you'll take the time to read the novel ahead of time because the workshop itself, which is only one week long, probably won't give you enough time to read it during the days of the workshop. So this video is intended to provide you with some background so you'll be familiar with the Korean history that is the setting for Richard Kim's work, Lost Names. By way of very brief introduction, the full title, of course, is Lost Names, Scenes from a Korean Boyhood. And it is a very powerful, very moving, at times very disturbing account of what it was like growing up as a boy in Japanese-occupied Korea. It's told, with the exception of the first chapter, from a boy's perspective, and in fact is based on the author's actual lived experience, although he says it's not an autobiography, because although the events that he depicts are actual events that happened to him, he's taken some liberties, moved some things around, and therefore he's reluctant to call it an actual autobiography. But he says these events or things very similar to them, perhaps not in the same order, were things that he actually experienced. And I think you'll get a sense of that, the powerfulness of that through his writing. Let's begin, though, with some background on Korean history. And I'm going to start in the late 19th century. So by the 1870s, 1880s, Korea had some foreign problems and some domestic problems. And I'll illustrate those foreign problems with this political cartoon. I think it's a perhaps French political cartoon. And what you see here is three people looking at a fish at the bottom of the screen. The fish is labeled Korea. And we see a figure on the left who's supposed to be a Japanese person and a figure on the right who's supposed to be a Chinese person, both of whom are eager to try to catch this fish labeled Korea. And kind of in the distance there on a bridge, not yet able to get his rod in the water, is someone who's supposed to be a Russian. And this was nothing new for Korea, surrounded by several powers that were much larger and stronger than it was. It often found itself buoyed about by those stronger powers in this case, the competition was primarily between the Japanese and the Chinese. And this tension led in 1885 to a treaty that those two countries signed that basically said both would agree to keep only minimal presence in Korea, but if either side were to move troops in, then the other side would be notified and could take action accordingly. And this kept the peace for perhaps about 10 years, but there were domestic problems that the Koreans were wrestling with as well. In particular, the elite class, which included the officials, were instituting very high rates of taxation and very oppressive legislation that commoners finally found so disturbing that they mobilized through a religious movement called the Tonghak, or Eastern Learning Movement, that became the leaders of a popular uprising that led to riots and protests around the country. And things quickly got out of hand, so much so that the king, King Kojong, felt he could not suppress this rebellion without turning to outside forces for help. And so Kojong called upon the Chinese military advisors who brought troops into Korea to aid in the suppression of this rebellion. And in keeping with the terms of the treaty they had signed, they let the Japanese know that they were doing this. But the Japanese took this as an excuse to bring their own troops to the Korean Peninsula as well. And although I'm going over this very quickly, the result was the First Sino-Japanese War. Sino, of course, being a term for China. So a war between China and Japan that took place from 1894 to 1895, primarily fought on the Korean Peninsula. And much to everyone's surprise, because China was the established power in the region and much bigger than Japan, everyone had thought the Chinese would win, but that was not the case. The Japanese won handily. You may recognize this political cartoon from one of my earlier videos. It depicts a Japanese diplomat now dressed in a Western coat and tails, dictating the peace terms of the Treaty of Shimonoseki to a very confused looking Chinese official there. One of the results of this was 
that China had to renounce all interests in the Korean Peninsula. And so for the first time in centuries, Korea had some measure of independence because if you study traditional Korean history, you'll see that for a long, long time, Korea had regarded itself as the younger brother of China and had very and sometimes almost slavishly followed Chinese ways. But from 1895 to 1905, there was a nominal degree of independence from foreign control. I say nominal, and I'll explain why in a second. First of all, some, some evidence of this independence. The kingdom was declared an empire, and this is important because in traditional East Asia, an emperor is a ruler who has no one above him. A king, however, is someone less than that. And the rulers of Korea had always been known as kings. By declaring themselves an empire, they were saying they were not subservient to anyone. In addition, there was public debate and public criticism of the various foreign treaties that the Koreans had signed. Most active in that effort was a group called the Independence Club, largely a group of intellectuals, but they started Korea's first newspaper. They held public discussions of politics and other events and they were eager to promote what we would identify as Korean nationalism. Unfortunately, they were not very long-lived. There were other efforts in the 1890s to update the education system, to create modern postal and judicial systems, to afford greater rights to women. So lots of things going on during this decade, but in the background, there's still competition between the Russians and the Japanese for which could be the predominant power in Korea. And in fact, many of these efforts were only possible with the support of some of those powers. So for example, the Japanese helped create the modern banking system in Korea. The Russians were key in um, helping to realize some mining interests and railroad interests. So the Russian and Japanese powers are still competing for control in Korea. And the result was in just a few years, they're headed towards war, as this political cartoon also suggests. By 1904, so less than 10 years after the end of the last war, Russia and Japan have gone to war. Again, the biggest prize in this conflict is the Korean Peninsula. And much to everyone's surprise, again, Japan wins this war handily. We see the political cartoon on the right there with young upstart Japan knocking old man Russia back on his behind while the world looks on with a look of shock on its face. The Japanese Navy enjoyed great success. It attacked in a, in a surprise attack, an unannounced attack at the Russian port of Port Arthur and sank the Pacific fleet while still basically in the docks. The Tsar ordered its, the Baltic fleet to sail literally around the world, but the Japanese defeated it in the very famous Battle of Tsushima. Land wars did not go quite as well. The Japanese did enjoy some victories, but they were at great cost. Uh, about a million men sent into combat and probably 10% of those either killed or suffered injuries. And the Japanese were bogged down and really had kind of reached the limits of what they could do by the time Teddy Roosevelt uh, intervened to negotiate the Treaty of Portsmouth. The result of the treaty was that Russia lost all of its claims and influence on the Korean Peninsula and soon thereafter, Korea was made into a Japanese protectorate. And this put Korea down the road toward becoming a Japanese colony. Let's talk about the steps to that process. First, in 1905, the Japanese forced the Koreans to sign the so-called Yulsa Treaty, which made Korea into a protectorate. But the king, King Kojong, refused to sign it, and the Japanese bullied members of his parliament into signing it in his place. This, of course, led the Koreans to feel that the treaty was invalid since their ruler had not actually signed it. Nonetheless, it was put into practice, and many Koreans were very upset about this. In fact, one of the king's ministers, Prince Min, committed suicide in protest over Korea losing some measure of its independence. In 1907, King Kojong sent diplomats to The Hague in an effort to protest to the rest of the world about the forced signing of this treaty, but the Japanese anticipated this and had the embassy denied entry. They also forced King Kojong to abdicate and they dissolved the Korean army, some members of whom went on to form basically guerrilla units, the so-called righteous troops, which fought against the Japanese for many years thereafter. Finally, in 1909, An Chung-gun, a Korean patriot, 
assassinated the, the Japanese governor general, Ito Hirobumi. He was captured and executed, and in part as a consequence of this, the following year, the Japanese annexed Korea, depriving it of any final step, final measure of independence, and making it into a true Japanese colony. And this then becomes the setting for our story, Japan, Korea rather, during its colonial period. We should note that not all Koreans were necessarily opposed to Japan's role on their peninsula. To some, they saw Japan as an enlightened model for the Koreans. They looked at how the Japanese had succeeded in the Meiji Restoration and in reforming, modernizing, and westernizing their country, and they believed that many forces in Korea were too conservative to do that on their own, so they saw Japan as a sign of hope that Korea could modernize as well. Many of the Western powers similarly viewed Japan as a power that might help teach the Koreans to become a strong and independent modern nation of their own. There was even a large society called the Il Chinhoya, the Unity and Progress Society, which very much supported Japan and its involvement on the Korean Peninsula. And of course, there were many who profited from this, uh, landowners, businessmen, people who were selling to the Japanese or who could make a profit from this. So there were cases of cooperation and there were cases of collaboration. And that's part of why the colonial period is very difficult for Koreans to talk about even today, because it isn't just a question of the Japanese as the bad guys, but there were, if you want to use that term, bad guys among the Koreans themselves. Nonetheless, by 1910, Japan had become the prize colony of Japan's colonial empire. You see here depicted on the map with dates at which different parts of East Asia became part of Japan. We commonly divide Japanese rule into three sub-periods. The initial 10 years or so are often referred to as the period of subjugation. There were arrests, um, suppression of terrorist and guerrilla movements and the like, but this led to a protest in March of 1919 called the March 1st Movement. And although that effort was also suppressed, it did lead to a change in the way in which Japan tried to rule Korea to a period of so-called cultural accommodation, where there were some greater freedoms. There were, Koreans were allowed to publish some of their own newspapers, a loosening of some of the other restrictions that were put in place. But from 1931 onward, as Japan became more involved in war on the Asian mainland, they decided they could not afford this relaxed posture in Korea, and instead became even more aggressive in trying to make Korea a part of Japan, the period of assimilation. And it's during that last period that most of our reading will take place. The March 1st movement that I mentioned, again in March of 1919, domestic organizers read a self-written Korean Declaration of Independence, and most estimates agree probably over a million people marched in the streets, many of them chanting manse, uh, the term which basically means Korea lives for 10,000 years. The Japanese responded to this, although the protests were nonviolent. The suppression of it was violent in some cases. Many were arrested, jailed, or even killed. By the 1930s, Korea had modernized in many ways. There were improvements in the education system and the infrastructure, improved agricultural techniques, but these things all came at a price, and that price was Korea and its economy was very much designed to support Japan. So you see here images of um, Korean agricultural workers or agricultural foodstuffs being mobilized to support the Japanese war effort, or a scene in a, a Korean town there rather, which I'm not sure how many of you know these languages, but the storefront signs are all converted into Japanese. Or again, in, during the assimilation period, Koreans were forced to use only Japanese while in school and even to take Japanese names, to give up their own traditional names, but adopt Japanese names. As you can guess, this leads in part to the name of the novel that we will be reading. Really, many of these policies could be described today as an attempt at cultural genocide, an attempt at making the Koreans into good Japanese subjects. So that's some background, and it brings us then to our novel. There are seven chapters to the novel. They could each be read on their own, although I think they work very well together as well. And I've given you seven questions to think about, not necessarily one per chapter, 
but just some things that I hope will get you thinking about the bigger issues going on in this book that we'll discuss then when we meet together. The first chapter, as I mentioned, is told from not the boy's perspective, but rather the perspective of his mother. I asked you to think about whether how that limits us, does it effective, and what do we learn or not learn from that. Chapter two, I'm sorry I've spoiled perhaps the end of it, but uh, I think you'll still find it a very powerful read. Question three isn't necessarily tied to chapter three. I guess I'm asking you to think a little bit about the role of family throughout the book and how this book doesn't just tell us about the Japanese, but also teaches us some things about traditional Korean society. The last three questions, I think they'll be evident, self-evident as you read the story. The last one perhaps may be the most interesting though. Richard Kim, as the question poses to you, does not consider lost names to be an anti-Japanese book. Do you agree with that? Is it a book about love, about hate, or about something else altogether? I very much look forward to your comments and hearing your reaction to this novel when we get a chance to talk about it together. I'm sure you'll enjoy reading it. Of course, please feel free to bring your questions about it too. Thank you very much.